be in the book of Zechariah, or Malachi, excuse me, I was on last week's, end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and looking how God revives, the book of Malachi, all four chapters, as we wrap up the Old Testament, our survey of it, and uh, fear not, we won't neglect the Old Testament, we will be back next week, but as far as the series, we'll be finishing up our survey of the Old Testament. Let's begin with prayer as we look to God's Word. Lord, we pray for ourselves as we hear your Word today to work in our hearts, that you would be first in our hearts, that we would love you with all that we are. That we would not relegate you to just something we do. But that our service, our obedience would come out of a heart that loves you above all else. Lord, revive our hearts. Make us lights in this dark world. Help us to love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Malachi, all four chapters. And as we begin, I'd like to ask a question, and somewhat rhetorical. But why are you here? And having heard me preach probably more than once, you may ask yourself the same thing. I probably would ask the same thing of myself as well. But really, why are you here? It's Sunday because we do church on Sunday. Growing up, I would go to church, but when your dad's the pastor, you have to kind of be there. But why are we here? Are we here because of a list of religious do's and don'ts, a list of obedience that requires us to be here? Are we just, because of this, going through the motions? Or maybe you just had some time left over in your week to finally give to God. Essentially, Hebrews 10, 25, primary reason. Essentially, what I would like you and I to consider today is whether we are here today for religion or because we love God. Are we here because it's commanded? Are we here because we want to? In the book of Malachi here, God is going to deal with some people, the nation, the returned nation, who are going through the motions. They're doing their religion. But the way they do it shows they have no love for God. Their hearts are cold. And so God sends one last messenger before 400 years of silence to revive the people. God, in his mercy and his grace, so often sends his message through his word to revive our hearts. So let's look together here at the beginning of Malachi in the first chapter together and see how our God, who is merciful, who is gracious, revives us from cold religion. The people, when they returned from captivity, As we noted even with last week, they were expecting the Messiah to appear with the return. We're back in the land. We can have a nation again. We're expecting God to set up his Davidic king, his Messiah on the throne. What's interesting is if you read one of the first persons back is actually in the line of David. Zerubbabel is in the kingly line. And even though he's a prominent figure, he is not even a governor. 
and the people are expecting God to do this great and mighty thing, and when he doesn't do it on their timetable, they decide almost in unison and in passing, God's forgotten about us, we'll just do what we're required to do and no more. People you meet sometimes in the service industries that hate their job, and the only reason they're there is they need And so when they give you your fast food order, they throw it at you, and your fries go everywhere, and your, your, your meal is just disheveled. That is what's happening here in many ways. Let's look at the verses together, beginning. God through Malachi, and God is going to give us throughout the book both sides of the conversation. He's going to speak both sides. God is playing advocate for the people with himself. I would say devil's advocate, but that seems a little wrong to be speaking about God that way. Here, he's speaking, though, for them, and also his reply. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Pretty standard operating, right? A a son is supposed to honor his father. It's built in the law. A a servant should honor his master, do what he's told to do, that sort of thing. And then God takes the next logical step and says, if I am a father, basically my people, where is my honor? And if I am a master, that's why we call him Lord, Where's my fear? All this says the Lord of hosts to notice who it is first addressed to. O priest, to you, O priest, who despise my name. Some serious things are going on if the priests are the ones God is calling out who are despising God. Have you ever not liked someone? But then they do something to you, and then you, you ratchet up to despising. Here, God says the priests are despising him. And then he says, but you say, how have we despised Where is your evidence? We're going through the motions. We're making the sacrifices. How have we despised your name? God says, this is the way you've been doing it, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor Will he accept or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. Here is the the first line of defense of They're supposed to be the ones that say, no, you can't offer that. What is the requirements in the Old Testament law? It's supposed to be without blemish, without injury, pure, spotless, a lamb. And here the people are coming along going, well, that one broke its leg. I don't think it's going to mend, so I need to sacrifice for this week for my sin. So I'll take that one. Kill two birds with one stone. I don't want it. Let me get rid of it. Let me sacrifice it to God. And the priests are in cahoots and even offering such sacrifices. The ones who are supposed to be called and called out to be the intermediary between God and man and man and God. And they don't even care. And God here makes a point in verse 8. If you were to take what you're offering to me and go and take it to your governor, whether it's Nehemiah or the more regional governor based out of Samaria, do you think you would get favor out of this? Do you think your governor would be so happy to get a broken lamb that he's going to honor you and give you extra privileges and may go, you know what, 
I like you so much, let's not, I, you don't need to pay taxes this year. See if your governor will accept what you have to offer. This is the situation. But now, and now, entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. You, you offer such things, and then you ask God, hey God, would you do what I want you to do and give me all the blessings with such gifts from your hand? Will he show favor to any of you? You give him the line, the blame, the and you expect God to respond positively, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 10, and oh, that there were one among you who might shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. Imagine it got so bad that God's like, I wish there's at least one priest that would stand up for things and just shut down the temple. Just close the doors. I'd rather have no one come up than you to do what you're doing. Because the people had gotten cold. But God doesn't care, so we'll just give them what's left over. We're just going through the our, our cold religion. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it. Look out what's coming. My name will be great whether you want it or not or care. Or even now you make it common and worthless. When you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that it is, its food may be despised. Who cares about what we offer to God? As long as we go through the motions, make it common, make it worthless. But you say, what a weariness this is. We have to bring stuff to God. Oh, so much work. Reminds me of our four-legged friend last night. So much work yesterday. He lays upon his pillow last night and breathes heavily a sigh. And I wanted to look over at him and go, what was, what's wrong, you little freeloader? And that's their attitude. Oh, we have to do much. In fact, God says, and you you says, Lord of hosts, is something to be in contempt. You bring what has been taken by violence. Some people are bringing sacrifices they've stolen from their neighbor. You bring lame or sick, and this you bring as an offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Will God accept such things? Cursed be the cheat, who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Imagine saying, well, God, I really want you to be happy with me. I, I promise I'll obey what you said to do. I I'll bring the spotless lamb. And then look around and go, well, maybe God's not looking. Let me get the one that that's broken. Let me take that one. Why is that one cursed? Because... I am a Greek king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. You think you can get away with it. But God is great and worthy of correct worship. Go to forward to chapter 3, if you would. Chapter 3, picking up in verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6, continues the same theme. 
And God says here, for I, the Lord, do not change. All right, do you think my expectations changed over and over again? The Bible tells us God is unchangeable. He is the same yesterday, today. And yet they think now God will be okay with the broken, the lame, the blind, the stolen as sacrifices. For I, the Lord, do not change. And because he does not change, his expectations do not change, but also his mercy and his grace does not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Because I'm gracious to you and merciful, you've not been consumed. For from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Look at the history of Israel even through to the modern era. This is their biography. Oh yeah, God will obey you. Well, let's go worship this calf. Oh, God will obey you. Save us from from our enemies. And then we get a judge. And then a generation later, a generation who did not know God comes on the scene. What do they do? And over and over and over again, even through the era of the kings, it's no better. Even in the modern era, they're looking for the Messiah who's already But because of God's character unchanging, he's gracious to them, and they're not consumed. They've turned aside even from the beginning of the nation. And so God says here, return to me. Return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you said, how have we robbed you? In your tithes, your contributions, you have a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. It's interesting how often God tests us in this way. Oh, I can't afford it. God says, just try me. Do what I've asked. And see if I won't bless you. And yet, they hold back from God, they rob him. And so God says, I will rebuke the devourer for you if you'll do what I've asked. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine and the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. They're experiencing the same thing that was happening in the days of Haggai. When they're wondering why we plant so much and get so little, when we put our money in our pocket, it flows through. Because they had neglected the work God had given them. And here, the same thing God says do what you're commanded. Come because you love me and see if I won't bless and turn back the one devouring. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Anybody want to go visit Israel right now? Might be a little spicy. Is it a land of delight yet? No, not really. Because they still have the same problem. We have the same problem Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Why why should we do what he says? Why should we be sad? Why should we mourn over it? And now we call the arrogant blessed. You could read this verse and see our country. We call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers are not only prosper, but they put God to the test. 
and they escape. Everything is flipped upside down and we wonder why. Because like Israel in this day, we have been practicing cold religion, going through the motions as the church in America. And God has sent his message to revive us from this cold religion, a cold religion that robs God. Because we think we can do whatever we want. We're our own person. We're rugged individualists. And we forget, you shall love the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Instead, we serve ourselves. And we go through our religious motions. God revives us from cold religion that robs him and from cold religions that offers the worthless. The leftovers. Can you imagine if, if we were still under the, the sacrificial system and if we came in together today to offer and we brought in, we brought in some Tupperware and just dumped over, out what we left, have left over from our meals this week? I think that would really please God. Some of us don't even like to eat leftovers, let alone offering it to God. Or maybe let, let's pull it out to our animals. If we had the sheep, broken, limping, well, we need to put it out of its misery, so we're going to offer it to God. that offers what is worthless and even that celebrates evil. If you've paid attention to some of the news of our day, yet another denomination Christian is splitting over evil. Frankly, if they were truly following Christ in the Bible, it wouldn't a but we as the church in America, I dare say even maybe sitting here, maybe even myself, have been practicing cold religion that has even celebrated evil. And God, in his mercy and his grace, because of his unchanging nature, sends the message to revive us from cold religion because of his mercy, because of his grace. Because of that, we are not ashamed. Secondly, from chapter 2, if you'll turn over there, beginning in verse 17, going to chapter 3, the end of the chapter 2, beginning in the third chapter, we're going to see by his mercy and his grace revives us by his presence. Saying at the beginning, revive us again. That should be our cry. God, come and revive us. Send your spirit to kindle us once more. Here in chapter 2, 17, this God revives us by his you have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in him. Does that sound like our nation? Even some churches. Or by asking where is the God of justice? Maybe you haven't been saying the first, but you really have been wondering with all the evil in the world, where is God and his justice? Maybe he's forgotten. And we weary the Lord because even though we look for his justice, 
We've been just going through the motions and our love for God has not been there. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Behold then, to solve their problem and to solve ours, to finally meet their expectation, they're expecting the Messiah to come. What's God promise here? Chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. This is yet another foretelling of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. I'm sending my messenger before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. God's solution to their cold religion, to our cold religion, is his presence. And here it's a promise yet again of the Messiah coming, being God with us. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Much like other places in the Old Testament where we have the coming of the Messiah, we we get the full compressed picture. Both comings together. And the question when he comes is, can we stand there? Do you think we could endure such a thing? Who can stand when he appears? Why? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Both very caustic and deadly if not used correctly. A refiner's fire takes metal and melts it down and keeps it hot so all the impurities can rise to the surface and be pulled off. Fuller's soap. Well, it'd be like dousing yourself in bleach. And refining and cleaning and searing to cleanliness. Who can endure such a thing? He will sit, this one who is God, who the messenger has gone before. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. Who do we start off with as the ones who weren't doing their job? who are just leading the nation in cold religion. The priests. So God says, I'm going to start with the Levites. They're going to get refined. The sons of Levi, and I will refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. I'm going to refine. We could put it this way. He's going to revive. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi could be speaking about our nation today. All the social ills we have, they're represented here. Promiscuity, just rampant. Divorce, rampant. Any and all kind of occultism. Liars. We just call those politicians today. People who oppress their hired workers. Why are we having... Why are people clamoring for it? Because they can't buy eggs. Because prices are so high and wages are so small. How many do we have sitting in foster care just waiting to have a family? How many more do we kill out of convenience? How many who who are seeking something better do we thrust aside? All because we don't fear God. 
all because our religion has grown cold. And all these ills will be solved by Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Chapter 4, verse 1. When God comes, when the messenger comes before the Lord, and then the Lord returns now, knowing that they, as we look back, there's a second coming. In that day, all those who are done, have done evil, the arrogant, they're going to be like stubble. And God's got the torch. If you ever watched, especially in our area, after a farmer is going to let his, or a rancher is going to go, usually he's going to go, he cuts his last cutting of hay or whatever he's grown that year, and then to help clear out the root system, to help return the nutrients of the plants back to the soil, he burns the field. How fast does dry plant go? And here God uses that as an image to describe those who do evil, even the proud. That's what arrogant here means. And those are going to be like stubble in the field, cut down, and ready for burning. God is going to come, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that will leave them neither root nor branch. But clean it out. But you, for you who fear my name, the Son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. We actually, my wife and I got an illustration of this last week, I think it was, as we were returning back uh, home after church. And here's this little calf, and he was having a grand old time. He came out, he was running around between the cows and just jumping up and down. He was a calf leaping for joy. And to those who have been revived... To those who aren't just practicing cold religion but have a love for God by which the entire law and prophets are fulfilled. This day, instead of a terror where we're burned, is rather a day of healing, a day of joy. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On, that, on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. The very thing they'd forgotten to do. Oh, they were going through the motions, but where does it start? Chapter 6, Deuteronomy, what did we read? Love the Lord your God. There's the beginning of the law. And they've forgotten it. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Before this second coming, really, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The promise throughout these two passages in Malachi has been the presence of God. And it will either be reviving for us or damnation. But know that God, he revives us by his presence. The solution is his presence. We've used this before, but I, I saw a sign once, a church sign. If you feel far from God, guess who moved? And the answer is you. Did not he even say in this book, I am unchanging? Maybe we need to get back into his presence. Maybe we need to re enter his courts with praise and singing. God revives us by his presence. Lastly, God, merciful and gracious, revives us to serve him. There's an end goal here. 
It starts with our heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Other things come after that. Keep the Sabbath day, for it's holy. Don't profane my name. Don't use it as a curse or commonality. Honor your father and your mother. Don't steal. All the instruction for their corporate worship. But it all started with love me. And from love me to serve me. That's why even in the New Testament we see God in his mercy and grace has saved us through Jesus Christ as a gift. But then what? Unto good works. There's an expected outcome here. There's an expectation that God reviving us produces something. Service to him. Chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. Because where two or three are gathered together, there he is. God paid attention, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. There's expected action. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Do you see the parallelism? Between the righteous and the wicked or... How do we know someone's righteous? Can I look in your heart? Do I, do I have a scope in my Bible? I just hold it up and I can see whether you're, you're righteous or wicked? No, even Jesus says, by their fruits you know them. Between the one who serves God and the one who doesn't serve Him. Who's revived? Who is right before God? The one who serves. And the basis of that service is and keep my commandments. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And God here is calling expecting the Messiah and didn't see it happen yet and decide, well, God will just do his thing, we'll do ours, and we'll just follow through the motions. God's calling them and reviving them. Calling himself. Instead of going and offering the worthless and robbing God, he's calling them back to a vital relationship. So they can whether or not they are the righteous or the wicked. God, he's reviving us to serve him. Just as the people of this day, to be his witnesses, to go into all the world and to proclaim the good news, to make disciples, to teach them to observe all that he's commanded. It has to start with our hearts being revived, rekindled. We started with asking ourselves a question of why we're here. Maybe we need to ask ourselves if we're here old religion or if we're here because we love God. We love God, or are we here because this is Sunday and this is what I have to do? It's on my calendar. It's on my to-do list. Are you practicing cold religion like the Israelites? 
Or are you here because you love God? One of the ways you can know is ask yourself, have I been giving God the leftovers? The ones I didn't want? Or have I been giving God my best? The first. Even before God gave the law through Moses, the expectation was first and pure. Look at Cain and Abel. Oh, Cain brought the first fruits, but it wasn't acceptable because it wasn't a lamb, pure. But even with the law, as we celebrate harvests and other things, there was an expectation as a tithe we give the first. Are we giving God first of our hearts and first of our time, let alone first of our economic ability? Or are we just giving the leftovers? Well, God, if I have time, I'll, I'll get to your word. Maybe I'll, I'll spend a little time in prayer with you. Are we giving the first? Are we giving God the leftovers? Will you and I be revived by Jesus to serve him? If you love me, Keep my I have not come to set aside but to fulfill. And the fulfillment's found in love, the Lord your God, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So as the Old Testament ends, even as we look expectantly for the return of Christ, will we be revived to serve him now? For he's coming, and his day will be the great and terrible day of the Lord. Who can stand? It will be ever finer. It will be like fuller's soap. Will he be the righteous? Or the wicked? Will you have served or not? Will be revived today? Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help. We ask for you to work in our hearts that we would be revived. Of all the distractions in our world, even many good things, many things that we should be uh, fighting for in right and goodness. God, we ask that we would have nothing greater than you. That our hearts would love you above all else, even ourselves. That with every part of our being, we would love you and it would come out in our obedience, our service to you. The giving, the leftovers, the broken, the lame of our lives would be unthinkable. That we would know your presence that we would have a share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ and that we would know the power of his resurrection. God, I pray for each of us, whether here or listening abroad, work in our hearts, O Lord, that we would love you, revive our hearts, Make us more like that we would love him and keep his commandments. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.